as a little kid, I have been fascinated by birds. And I'm an artist and I've always incorporated birds and uh, wildlife into my artwork. And even to this day, I, I, I constantly paint birds. I think I love the fact that birds can fly, that birds have beautiful colors, their plumage, their feathers are, are beautiful, and birds produce beautiful sounds with their songs. So, you know, if I think about that, no other animal has that much going for it than birds. So that's kind of cool. Um, I'm what you would call a birder, but the guy I'm about to introduce is way up here. He's a birder extraordinaire. He has made a career out of birding, and uh, I'm honored to uh, introduce him today. Bruce DeLabio's passion for birds began at the age of seven when he hand-tamed a family of chickadees at his cottage in Constance Bay. And for over 50 years, Bruce has been an avid birder and involved in the field of ornithology. He's worked for museums and written many, many articles on the subject. Most recently, he worked for uh, the Ottawa Citizen, writing a weekly column on birds. He's led birding expeditions all over the world, from Costa Rica to South Africa to the Arctic Circle. He's even won many awards and birding competitions for identification and sheer numbers of species seen. It is an honor to welcome you, Bruce, this morning. Thank you so much for being here and uh, joining us today to share your knowledge and uh, your passion for birding. Welcome. Okay, thank you so much, Graham, for those kind words. Yes, I've uh, spent a lifetime birding and been fortunate to travel a lot. And uh, yeah, my passion for birding goes right back to when I was a kid and black capped chickadees are responsible for it, as you said, once I, once I learned how to Hand, hand tame them. Um, I uh, carried on just enjoying looking for different birds around the Ottawa area from my backyard to up at my cottage. So I'm going to uh, uh, just to let everybody know this is only the second time I've ever done a uh, talk online so you're going to have to bear with me. Um, I'm going to first, uh, the talk is basically on like an introduction to bird watching in the Ottawa area, getting started. Um, and it's for birding, it's very easy. I mean, there's birds everywhere we go, backyard, local parks, you know, down at the beach, along rivers, everywhere you will always see birds uh, and all different seasons of the year. Now, basically, equipment. Um, all you need is a, your eyes, basically. Uh, but if you can have a, a, a pair of binoculars, doesn't matter the quality of them. They're always a definite asset for you. Binoculars, there's all kinds of different types of binoculars nowadays, but this is one of the ones I started with originally back uh, decades ago. And um, a telescope, assists you in looking at birds at a distance. Now, I'm just going to get this. So this is just kind of give you a general idea of where we're situated in Ontario and Eastern Canada, that we're on a nice uh, migration route, which allows us to uh, see a lot of different species and in this little map here there there likely over 400 species of birds have been found in eastern ontario over the decades which is amazing for such a small area uh sorry i just got up yeah and bird watching can be done everywhere anywhere it doesn't matter if it's in the winter or if you're in you know so as uh, Graham said, South America, South Africa, anywhere in the world you go, there will be birds to see and lots of different species. I'm just trying to get my, uh, I think I have it going now. Okay. Yeah, and, I, and uh, 
as I said, binoculars and a field guide is all you need. Okay. And birding in the weather, different weathers, you just dress for the weather. You go anyway. Now, birds are found in a variety of habitats, which we have lo like lots of different habitats in eastern Ontario, from uh, the mixed forests, wetland areas, to open fields. Farmland is great areas for uh, bird, bird watching, and you can see so many different types of birds in these uh, habitats. Um, I don't know if you can see sitting on the fence post there, there's a snowy owl. And fields like uh, cultivated feed, both cultivated fields and uh, uh, fallow fields are really good for birds. Marsh areas attract a great variety. And of course, along the rivers, like the Ottawa River, the Rideau River, there's great areas for birding. And in fact, along the Ottawa River at uh, both Deschain Rapids and uh, Lemieux Island, we have some nice colonies of ring-billed gulls and uh, double-crested cormorants, which are all now um, present and, and in the process of building nests. And of course, our nice uh, extensive forests, uh, both hardwood and uh, coniferous, have uh, like over 140 different breeding species. Over the years, like over my 50 years, there's been so much change in bird life. It's, it's just amazing. Uh, this species called the Sandhill Crane uh, wasn't even in Eastern Ontario when I started. And nowadays, it is a regular breeder scattered all over Eastern Ontario. And uh, from, they even breed in areas just outside of Carp and outside of Carlsbad Springs and the Mare Bleu and Alford Bog. So it's pretty amazing how uh, numerous species have moved either from the west or from the south. And Bruce, those are about the size of a, a great blue heron, eh? Like yeah, actually, yeah, they're very actually they're very similar in in size in uh, size, and uh, um, the great blue heron, like kind of a local name for a great blue heron, is a crane. People refer to them as cranes, but they're actually in a whole different family. They're they're different from uh, cranes in general. Uh, but uh, but yes, yeah, we can. Uh, uh, they're about the same size, but they they like a drier habitat, whereas the great blue heron are, is found in wetland areas. Now, this is one one species that when I was a, a kid, like back in the late uh, '60s, uh, the evening grosbeak was a really common bird at feeders during the winter time, and then over the following. 15, 20 years, their numbers declined, and uh, they became kind of a rare, a rare sight. Now, there's various reasons. A lot of it was to do, they feel, with the spruce budworm, the crash of the spruce bud, budworm. Uh, but this past winter, we had uh, the highest numbers uh, since the 1980s, so it was pretty exciting to uh, see these guys. And they almost look more like a tropical type of bird. They're bright bright colors and that big kind of, uh, uh, that, well, the heavy, heavy beak on it for crushing up the uh, sunflower seeds. And in the wild, would they eat pine cones or what would they, what would they be eating? Well, actually in the wild, they will, um, a lot of these, you know, birds that come to our feeders during the winter time or even during the, you know, during the sum summertime, a lot of these guys eat uh, uh, insects and, and different types of, you know, from uh, worms and uh, other um, boreal forest uh, insects, surprisingly. But, you know, they do supplement their, their uh, food with uh, seeds also. 
Okay, just trying to. And this guy here, this is a bald eagle. This is an immature bald eagle. The bald eagle was on uh, was actually endangered back in the 50s and 60s in North America. Um, and it was because of a chemical called DDT and uh, that they were using in agricultural areas and which got into water systems. And it basically the eggshells of a lot of the bigger birds of prey, so hawks and eagles and ospreys, um, along with some other larger birds, uh, their eggshells were extremely thin and would break. So uh, there was a major, major decline in this species. Now, once they stopped using it, it took a number of decades before these birds of prey slowly increased in numbers and spread back into their former ranges. And we have bald eagles that actually breed in the Ottawa area starting back in 2012. So it's been a very, uh, you know, it just shows you certain things that we've done to the environment over this last 50 years. Once it's stopped, bird, the bird life can uh, come back. Just to, about the bald eagle, um, you're going to see those towards water because of their of their food source, right? Correct. Oh yeah, yeah. So basically, like bald eagles, I mean, they don't nest. They don't necessarily have to nest right beside a lake or a river. I mean, they're they they can range far and wide, but they're big time scavengers. So they look around for anything that could be just dead floating on the water. But they also like fish that's one thing they do hunt for during the summer you know summer months when they're raising their family but in the winter they you can find them just scouting out over you know frozen lakes and woodland areas they eat um, you know say a deer that's fallen through the ice and died they'll scavenge that like you can actually i've i've seen seven or eight bald eagles at once on the ottawa river just eating the carcass of a of a deer now i bet you a lot of you have seen the northern cardinal now, this is a very interesting bird, it's, you know, brightly colored. It's a very kind of wide, widespread bird nowadays. You hear it singing in the morning. It probably wakes you up in your neighborhood now uh, because they are breeding. But when I started birding, they basically weren't here. These guys have moved in in the past hundred years. Back, they came into Canada down in uh uh, in Essex County near Point Pelee National Park at the, at the around the uh, 19 early 1900s and they slowly made their way north and as feeding birds became a popular activity during in the 60s and into the 70s these guys adapted they would come to feeders in the winter time they'd be they'd survive our winters and then their numbers increased and now like there's hundreds of them so it's pretty exciting to have this kind of a, a southern bird now a you know common uh, resident in our area and bruce they would be breeding like their nests are more in evergreens like they're not in an open area because of their color i find yeah oh yeah yeah um uh, cardinals a couple of things when they a lot of people don't even know they have them at their feeders because of their bright color especially the male they'll come into the feeders either early in the morning like at, right at dawn or come in at dusk and feed where you know people are busy making supper whatever you're doing ac uh, activities so um yeah and because of their bright colors they really um you know kind of they hide in you know, cedar trees, cedar hedges, which they also tend to breed. And that's usually around a house. There's a lot of people have cedar trees and cedar hedges. They like thick, dense uh, vegetation to nest in. And they're actually nesting right now. I, um, I, I had a pair, they were in the process of build, building a nest. And um, so it'll be the matter of the next couple of weeks, the, you know, the first eggs will hatch. 
Now this guy, you may look at him and go, it's kind of ugly looking, but the turkey vulture is a, a species that moved into our Eastern Ontario during the 50s and 60s from the South. If you ever been down in, in like Southern, well, in Florida or in, on winter vacation or anything, you see all kinds of turkey vultures. These guys are big time scavengers and you'll see them along the highways uh, locally um, in Eastern Ontario. They are, they've exploded in numbers or they breed right up into uh, uh, up towards Algonquin Park now. Um, and what's interesting, when birds increase in numbers, then they start arriving earlier. So turkey vultures nowadays uh, start arriving anywhere from mid, mid-March mid onward, whereas when I first started birding, uh, we didn't. I didn't see my first turkey vulture until like 1973, and then it would take a number of years before they became a regular uh, visitor and then breeder. And what's kind of interesting with these guys, you know, with all the old buildings and farmhouses uh, abandoned in our area, they will nest in buildings, un, you know, underneath a rotting floor, and uh, you know when you find a turkey vulture nest because you smell it first because of their uh well because they're scavenging rotting meat and everything and and their and their droppings have a very very uh unique smell smell to them do you know bruce a lot of people when they uh, see a big bird flying in the sky they think it's an eagle but um, I don't know if you could give anyone a pointer about how their wings are that would change, you know, identify them flying and circling. Yeah, the turkey vulture is kind of unique in its shape. Whereas we see like a big bird of prey, like a bald eagle, you would notice the bald eagle has big flat wings and um, actually very broad flat wings uh, and a fairly large, large head. Whereas a turkey vulture, is kind of unique in its silhouette. It holds its wings up on a slight angle and teeters back and forth in the winds as it's as it's you know soaring over overhead. And when you look up at them, you'll notice their wings are two toned. So they have a pale area and then black, and it really stands out. And when you, and one thing that's kind of neat about the turkey vulture is they're very social and 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 you can see like a group of, of 10 or 15 of them all together soaring around overhead, which is something you don't see with other large birds of prey. Now this is, whoop, this isn't, let me see, let me go, oh, I'm, uh, just have to, a little technical difficulty. Yeah, here it is. This is the black capped chickadee. This is what started me into bird watching big time. Once I had, had it was so exciting. It took a number of uh, weekends to finally, uh, the chickadees became tame, tame enough and accustomed to me. They landed in my hand and I started to feed them. And I, and I did that for an, a, a number of years up at the cottage. Now, if anybody's been around any of the NCC trails, like Jack Pine Nature Trail, Sarsaparilla Trail, or even over at Mud Mud Lake, there are lots of hand-tamed black-capped chickadees nowadays. And in fact, kind of, it's interesting that the birds have become uh, so accustomed to us along trails and putting feed out in that, that in the last 10 years, I've had species like uh, downy woodpecker and red-breasted nuthatch, and I even had a northern cardinal male land on my hand. So it's amazing how things have changed over the decades. This is I, uh, I, Go ahead. I, I'm just going to say that this, this winter I did the same thing. I stood super still outside by my feeder, 
and a huge flock of common red poles came down and they were coming to feed at my feeder. But I stood still and I had some seed in my hand and I had maybe five or six on my arms feeding, you know, and hopping around. So it was amazing. But you need a lot of patience to train yeah. a bird. And you have to stand still and, and uh, be like a rock. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And you don't want to try and do it when it's minus 25 out because it does get cold out there. <laughs> it's tough. Yeah, and American goldfinches, that's a species that very, can be very common at your bird feeder in the wintertime. Uh, those are birds in their breeding plumage. So their summer plumage are uh, like, they're, we refer to them as canaries. They're a bright yellow with black on it, on them. So there's just a couple of little photographs here of, uh, of bir various birds that are feeding you have cardinals on the left, and then on the right you have that a flock of starlings eating staghorn sumac bear uh, uh, fruit. So in the winter time, birds will come to feeders, but they also look for natural food. And during the course of the winter, once it you know winter set in for a number of uh, months, birds really can get hard done by finding food. So kind of the last resort is the staghorn sumac fruit. Now, as you said, Graham, here's your flock of common red poles. When they come in in the wintertime, some winters, there's just, well, this past winter, there were thousands in the Ottawa area. And it's kind of neat, this little bird breeds up in the Arctic and like willow thickets along the, um, uh, Hudson Bay, uh, and even further north, right up into the Yukon. So you've got to be hardy to to survive up up uh, north. And they're really tame, actually. They, you can walk out of your house if they're feeding at your feeder, and they seem to not fly away that, you know, they're not skittish. Oh, yeah, yeah. Again, with birds from, you know, the north, they're not accustomed, accustomed to seeing people, so they don't, you know, consider us a threat. And uh, yeah, you can actually get, just like you know you said at your feeder, you had them land on you, they can be extremely tame. Also, suet feeders are great to have in the winter time because this supplements uh, birds' food, particularly like insect eaters, like woodpeckers. Um, so that's a picture of a hairy and downy woodpecker ha um, eating suet, and the hairy is a bigger, one, the downy and hairy look very similar in plumage, but there's a big size size difference. And occasionally some oddities show up in the winter time and they come to your feeder. And this is a pine warbler coming to a feeder in Ottawa. Uh, occasionally birds during the fall migration, instead of migrating uh, south, immature birds, so young birds will occasionally get blown off course and end up further north of their wintering grounds and uh, will have to find food. And that's what this pine warbler survived the winter. Just just back to that shot. I don't know if you can go back, Bruce, but uh, yeah. just to point out to the students, a neat thing about uh, identifying those woodpeckers, a male and a female in terms yes. of, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So the woodpecker that this one right here that's on the suet cage, You'll see that red area on the back of the head, that indicates a male. So that's a male hairy woodpecker. And then down on the right, this here is a female downy wood, woodpecker, and they don't have any little red patch on the back of their head. So that's how you tell males, and that's with both species. So the male downy and hairy has a red spot on the back of the head, and the female downy and hairy don't. They just have the black and white markings. But one thing you'll notice too, I mean, if you had them side by side and you could see their bills, you see how short the bill on the downy woodpecker is, whereas the uh, hairy woodpecker has a longer bill, which is very, very noticeable. Now birdhouses, that's something that can be quite enjoyable if you can put a birdhouse, if you have, you know, if you live, you have some property, you can put up a bird, a birdhouse. So long, you know, years ago, purple martin houses used to be very common um, in the Ottawa area. People would put them up and attract them. Now there's been a big decline in purple 
Martin population over the last 50 years. And But there is a, a very active colony at Andrew Hayden Park in Ottawa over beside where the sailboats are. There's two big uh, uh, apartment buildings. That's what we call these bird, bird houses for Martins. Uh, and they're very active and in fact, Purple Martins, they just arrived back in the last couple of days. And what's amazing with this bird, it winters in Brazil. So just imagine how far it has to migrate every year from Ottawa down to Brazil and back. It's pretty amazing. And then, oh, the other bird, sorry, the other bird on the right here, this little birdhouse, that's a tree swallow. Tree swallow is a, a common summer bird of the Ottawa area and they're usually pretty easy to attract to a birdhouse. And these are all like insect eaters. This is what they uh, eat during the summertime. And then we have on our left here some of the ledge nesters, I call them, and cavity nesters. So you have the barn swallow, which is on your left. And anybody, if you drive around the country roads in farmland, most barns will have a, um, a couple of barn, barn swallows nesting. And what they do is they build a nest out of mud and they go fly down to a puddle, pick up a little dab of mud, stick it on the um, wall of the, far, of the building, and they continually do that, putting some uh, grasses and, uh, and they build it up and that's, and that's what they nest in. And woodpeckers, are great at making cavities. They can, you know, they're carpenters, basically. They can build, build their own home. And the pileated woodpecker, our largest woodpecker, uh, breeds, like it, even, like, it actually breeds, you would think of it as a bird that's gonna be in the big, you know, the big forests and that outside of the city, but it actually breeds in the city. Over the decades, you know, a lot of dying trees and, and they don't cut them all down nowadays. So we have them nesting right in Ottawa. Now the bigger birds that nest, the great, great blue herons build these huge stick, stick nests and they can have anywhere from two to four young. And it's uh, pretty amazing when the adult comes in from, from fishing for a while. And then there's always a big, big fight on who's, who's gonna get the most fish out of the young. Bruce, just a quick question. Um, we had snow and you know cold, cold weather just the other day. And yeah. how do birds adapt suddenly when like they're already starting to nest and then all of a sudden you have a big cold snap? Does that really affect them? Oh yeah, I mean, okay, it can. It depends on what species and um, like how cold. So say for example, the snow cover, I don't can't remember how much snow Ottawa got yesterday or the day before, but uh, down along the St. Lawrence area and further north of here, we had like a good inch to two or three or four centimeters of snow. And uh, so robins were having difficulty getting worms and the worms were, weren't coming out because they were either under the snow or, you know, still in the ground. So the robins, I watched them and they were picking up worms that were on the sidewalks that obviously had been there the day before. Um, but they also, if there's fruit around, so they, I saw them in some berry trees, some remaining berries will eat. Uh, so robins are pretty adaptable, whereas a tree swallow, being an insect eater, if it would have stayed really cold for a number of days, there could have been some issues, you know, with survival. Some birds do arrive early, but they can switch from insects to berries and back to insects. Uh, some other species can't, so it really depends on how long the cold spell is. And this one, I would say, was relatively short. So I, th I think most of the birds will have survived, survived this cold spell in snow. They may have to re-nest, which means maybe their eggs were, you know, uh, 
the, the eggs and the eggs have died, so they'll just re, re nest, and that that happens a lot. Let me just see here. Yeah, and again, American robin right now um, they're in the process of nesting. In fact, uh, there's a couple of them sitting on eggs, and they survive the uh, the cold and the snow. And on the right here, a pretty cool bird, the chimney swift. They're um, a, like a th sensitive or threatened species nowadays because they like to nest. They're a insect eater and uh, they spend most of their life flying around high in the sky. And but they nest in chimneys. That's where they, you know, that's where they got their name. And they make an interesting nest because they fly all the time. They pick the the nesting material, which is which are twigs, little twigs they pick up. They have to snap them off trees in flight, which is pretty amazing to watch. And I have actually witnessed it a number of times over, over the years because we had chimney swifts nesting in our chimney in carp. Um, and I was able to get up on top of the roof and look down the chimney. And here they were clinging to the side of the nest. These are two young that have left the nest, which is on the lower right. You can just see a few little uh, a little clump of sticks there, but their nest is very interesting and it's really hard to believe. It's held together with their saliva. So, you know, their spit or, you know, saliva, they stick it on the sticks and it, and it's like glue and it, which is amazing. And then the, they lay four to five eggs and I've watched this, all the young hatch and that nest clings to the side of the like the interior wall of the uh, chimney, no problem. And then they all, as soon as they're big enough, they got they have pretty uh, uh, not not huge feet, but but uh, large large enough with like really sharp kind of uh, claws, and they just cling on to the side of the chimney, and they can sit there or hang there, and the parents fly down the chimney and feed them until they're ready to go. They're like flying little cigars, I think, because they don't have a yeah. tail. They like, fl and they're way, way up high, and they kind of make a, a little chittering kind of noise. They're amazing. Oh, yes, oh, they do. And as you say, actually, one of the you know a common name you know with bird, bird watchers is just what you said. We call them flying cigars because they are that that shape. Now here's a bird that everybody can see in. Uh, in the Ottawa area, there's numerous nesting pairs nowadays. This is the osprey. This used to be called the fish hawk because they are big time uh, fishermen. This is what they hunt for. They, they, you'll see them over lakes and rivers. Uh, there's a number of nests um, in the Dunrobin area, uh, near Carp, near, I'm trying to think of places, uh, along the Ottawa River, but they were affected like the bald eagle with DDT. So they were very scarce back when I started birding, but nowadays are widespread and uh, they usually have two young. And again, they have a very distinctive uh, shape and they do a lot of hovering over the water because they'll spot a the spot of fish just below the surface of the water. Then they just plunge down and grab the fish. And it's amazing uh, the size of some of the fish they carry. Whoop. Sorry there. I'm not okay. going the wrong way. So there's lots of birds in the I'm Ottawa fine. Valley, as I was saying. Um, with over in Ottawa itself, we've had over 360 species. But always make sure what you're seeing is real. This is a nice little. They put this up to de, to deter pileated woodpeckers from pecking holes in hydro poles, telephone poles. Hi, Bruce. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, if this is Ann Nielsen here, how are you? Good, good. 
And do you have somebody moderating the chat for you for questions? Because there seems to be a lot of questions coming there in. There is a lot of questions. I'm just going to let Bruce talk till a quarter two or just a few more minutes, and then uh, we'll take questions from, uh, from all the students. And I know there is a ton of them. But he does have a few more images to go through, and then uh, we'll take questions from the group. Okay. Okay, that's good. So I'll just go. So here's yeah, just uh, a couple more birds for sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna just move. I have a few here. I wanna yeah talk about here. Here's one. This is one thing that's important uh, with birds. Certain species they use their camouflage to, to hide. They're, they they blend in. They pick a hole. Right here is a is a eastern screech owl in a hole, and you can see how it just blends into the tree trunk. So that's that's very important for them for survival. And here's a Merlin. This is a small falcon that actually now breeds right in our neighborhoods in Ottawa. It used to be called the pigeon hawk and uh, it has become a fairly common uh, bird in our area. Again, pileated woodpecker. This, these guys are like the size of a crow and easy to identify with that red, red crest. Another bird we see occasionally is the yellow-billed cuckoo. This is a cool little, uh, big, actually big, fairly fair-sized bird that just gets up into the Ottawa area where it's more common in the uh, south of us. This is one of my favorite groups, owls. Owls are always fun to watch. And here's a pair of long-eared owls. And what's interesting with, with birds of prey, so owls and hawks, the females are bigger than the males. And this is because the females lay the eggs and are, you know, sit on the nest, so spend a lot of time on the nest. So they're bigger than the male. You can see how, how much smaller they are. So overall, just a sec here. Overall, with birds, when you're out in the field looking at birds, you always encounter something else. And I was out one day birding, and a distance, a little bit of a distance behind me, this big black bear start, saw me. But it was it had stopped and it was actually eating dandelions, which was pretty cool to watch. So uh, with birding in general, uh, there's lots of birds to see, but wildlife in general, it's such a great experience. It's, you know, good exercise, um, lots of fresh air, and it's very, um, it keeps you thinking uh, when you're bird watching, you're always you know, trying to identify all these different species of birds and learning, and you have your field guides, or um, so you're always reading. So there's lots of great value out of bird bird watching, and you, something you can do with your friends, you can do it with your family. Um, so there's lots of uh, educational stuff for that you can get from birding, and here's uh, last photograph. This is a sandhill crane in flight and uh, it is an, uh, it's amazing this species again wasn't even in eastern Ontario and there's air areas now that they stage which means in the fall time big groups of them come and they spend weeks at a time in agricultural areas and feed and up towards Pembroke there's a spot that I had uh, over 800 uh, sandhill cranes two year two Octobers ago. So it's always amazing what you can find out there. I'm just going to add to that that I've never seen before. But now you have um, egrets, egrets in Ottawa, and I think I've never seen them years ago. White, beautiful white, white uh, birds like the size of a heron. Oh yeah, yeah. The great egret um, is a species that was. First recorded in Ottawa in August 1972, and then we didn't have any records for a long time. And then into the 90s, we get the odd one, and into the early 2000s. And then on, in 2012, 
I found a colony of five nesting great egrets. Now that colony is up to 10 or 15. So now you can see great egrets in the west end of Ottawa on the Carp River in Canada. Yeah, it is just truly amazing. There's been so uh, much change in bird life. So thanks for that. That's so informative. Um, we're going to have questions now from students, and I'm going to ask my uh, counterpart, uh, Katie Lewis Pryor, to uh, to go through the chat and just ask you a few questions, and then okay. uh, we'll conclude. So Bruce, we can treat this like a rapid round, and I know some of these questions uh, might be uh, tough. I'm going to ask you one from <laughs> Jennifer Calvers' uh, students today. What's your favorite bird you've seen? What? And I know you've seen an incredible now. Pick your pick one that comes to mind. Favorite play. bird that I have to say is the black-capped chickadee. It is the most friendliest. It's common. You know, it's widespread. It's a bird that started by passion for birding feeding it off it's like a little friend in the forest it's there you know it can you can count on it they're always out there it can be minus 30 or plus 30 they're always there they're so friendly so that's my favorite bird a uh, question from madame langdon's class what's the biggest bird that you have ever hand fed the, the biggest bird I've ever hand fed. That's a good question. I have I've fed a golden eagle. That's Whoa. the largest bird I have hand fed. And I fed it a piece of meat. That's crazy. It um, was. <laughs> it was amazing. Mrs. McLean's class uh, wants to know what one of the questions was the biggest bird you've ever seen and the smallest bird you've ever seen. Well, that's a very good question. So the smallest bird I've ever seen is actually the smallest bird in the world. It's called the bee hummingbird and it is found in Cuba. Um, that's the only place it's found in the world and it's the smallest bird in the world. And off the top, I think it's like, uh, I'd say like two and a half inches, so you'd have to convert that. For Move your me. fingers like it's like it's like a like a bee. <laughs> it, yeah, it is amazing how small it is. Now the biggest bird I've ever seen is the ostrich. I saw ostriches in um, Africa. Oh, so, that's yeah, amazing! And, and those are like monstrous, and obviously they do not fly because they're too big. Uh, from Mrs. Fife's class, question from Sophia in grade six. What is the rarest bird you've ever seen? The rarest bird? Well, that's again a very good question. Over the, you know, over the years, uh, I've seen a number of rare species. Probably, I'll say in Canada, the rarest species I've ever seen is the uh, whooping crane. And the whooping crane numbers dropped down to around 20 individuals in the 1940s. And um, through conservation and nesting and program, a variety of stuff that was done by the uh, uh, government, uh, they have recovered and there's maybe 500 in left now and uh, I was out birding in Saskatchewan a couple of falls ago and we got to see the largest flock ever of whooping cranes we had 159 whooping cranes at once so that was one of the most exciting birding moments I've ever had and and with a you know Canadian bird that breeds at Wood, Wood Buffalo National Park Okay, now these are going to be super rapid questions. I'm okay. going to ask you now. First one, have you ever seen a parrot? These are yes or no ones. Oh, lots of parrots, yep. Have you ever seen a flamingo? Lots of flamingos. And this one is from Alessia in uh, Ms. Zapovinia's class. Have you ever seen a Spix's macaw? 
No. <laughs> no. no, so, no, no. Tell, now Bruce has got one for his list. All right. Yeah. Show this with your hands, Bruce. How big is a blue heron's neck? How, How long is it? How long is a blue heron's neck? Neck? Yeah. Just the neck? Yes. Can you see me? I can. That's pretty long. Yeah, the neck is yeah. That's a big, that's a big section of of the bird, and then it has its long legs and the body itself, like the actual, you know, body part isn't uh, you know isn't as big. Okay, this is a great question from. Uh, they've all been great questions, but from Mrs. Cudahy's class, how long does it take a bird to build its nest? That's a very good question, and it really depends on the size of the bird, as in small birds build small nests, so they can build a nest, like I'll say uh, uh, a ruby-throated hummingbird, it could take, you know, three or four days to build a nest. Uh, a robin can take, you know, again, four or five days it all depends uh whereas an eagle like a bald eagle i watched a bald eagle building a nest and it took it a number of weeks to finally complete it so it really it is variable um and i know water birds like subspecies of ducks uh they can they they can build their nest uh, in a day or two, whereas a killdeer, which is a ground nester, just makes a little scrape on the ground, you know, in a, like could be like a gravel area. So it's a little scrape, which takes no time. This is another uh, really good question from Miss Calver's class. How can, and you sort of touched on it a bit, how can you tell if a bird is male or female? Okay, usually with most birds, uh, like I say, the majority of birds, the male has a bright plumage, you know, colorful plumage, and the female plumage is is duller because she's going to be sitting on the nest, so she needs to be more camouflaged. Whereas the male is nice and bright, and he's, uh, you know, singing from the tree treetop, or and you know, really obvious and brightly uh, colored to attract a mate. And maybe one last question before I have my own question uh, from uh, Margaret Bastasic's class. Um, how does birding help scientists with their research? Well, I mean, nowadays what's it's called citizen science. So there's a lot of people out uh, bird watching nowadays that they contribute information through various. Um, uh, like apps, like there's um, eBird, for example, through Cornell University. Uh, so there's a lot of data being entered into this uh, site that gives scientists lots of information that they can look at and, you know, from population uh, changes, you know, range expansions, lot, you know, lots of stuff like that, that, you know, uh, people, People like all of us, from kids to adults, can uh, can contribute to. So something like BirdNet, I think, which is Cornell or um, iNaturalist, you'd recommend using those apps to help uh, people who are starting to bird. Oh yeah, nowadays, yes, with all the technology, you know, social media, all all that now. That yes, like something like iNaturalist, if you're looking at trying to have something identified, you know, with Digital photography is, you know, exploded, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And with the quality of images that you can take with your iPhone or what, whatever your Android you have, you can send this, uh, you could send the image to um, iNaturalist and have it identified. So it helps you out. So speaking of identifying birds, uh, OCSB, we're hoping that you'll use um, our hashtag that we're using this month and perhaps into May, which is hashtag OCSB tweet tweet. 
And we're really hoping to see uh, student photos, uh, videos, and recordings, as well as the educators. And we've started to see some of them online. Bruce, is there a place where we can follow you on Twitter or uh, a website? Yeah, well, the only thing, uh, well, <laughs> the only thing I do nowadays is um, I, I put my stuff on Facebook. I have a, I, I do birding stuff on Facebook and pictures of birds and all that and little stories and information, it, but it's all on Facebook. That's awesome. Bruce, I'm just going to ask, there's a question way back in the chat and, you know, you talked about uh, black cap chickadees and how much you love them and I love them too and I've, I've trained them to eat out of my hand. How would you tell students to go about training, you know, chickadees to hand feed? What would be the steps? I mean, okay, for me, I did it during um, the winter time. So, or, or, yeah, late, late fall, early winter. So, you establish a bird feeder. So, you set up a bird feeder in your backyard. You build up your clientele. Then, once there's a number of chickadees that are regularly come to your feeder, just what I did, I slowly got closer to the feeder they became accustomed to me being there. And then I just worked my way up to, I was right beside the feeder and I would hold my hand over, like put my arm around the bird feeder and put seed in my hand. So the bird, the chickadees finally just landed on my hand, but it, it takes, you know, that took many hours to get them accustomed to me. And then I then I could go out um, right beside the feeder, have my hand out, and they would come come to my my hand. So there's no it's 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 patience, big time. Patience. And, and, no, and don't don't make any sudden movements. Really, you just as you said earlier, you gotta be a rock. Just don't move. Yeah. I think even with birding, you have to be patient. You know, you can be walking along and, and hope to see all these amazing birds, but you've got to actually put some time into going in the field and, you know, looking in trees and in habitat. Oh, yeah. you got to cover different habitats. You, you know, when you're out in the field, you know, you, you know, you got to be quiet. you got to be focused, looking around, seeing movement, listening for birds, what's singing, trying to, you know, uh, track them down by song and then see their field marks. But yeah, you got to be you got to be quiet. I, I wanted you to talk about just one other little trick that birders use to bring to call in birds, like like warblers and uh, and birds in the field. Is a, a little trick that we sometimes do. Yeah, yeah. So to try to attract birds, so you're out in the field or you're you know out in a, a forest and you hear all. You can hear little call notes in that. One thing that birders do, it's called pishing. So you make this sound, you go Now birds will hear that. And particularly if chickadees are around, like black cap chickadees, they'll come in to investigate. And if you keep doing it and make it more intense, the chickadees will start doing their dee dee dee, chickadee dee dee dee, which will in turn attract other small birds like warblers and vireos and maybe, you know, nuthatches. But it's like a chain reaction. Everything starts to come in. And I've done this sometimes and had 10 different species of like warblers, vireos, sparrows. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. But it's just making this little sound. Um, and it works. And I, I, I highly recommend that for students, you know, get outside, go for a walk in, in the forest, listen for birds and try that pishing noise and stand really still and you will see them start coming into you and, and uh, you know, it's kind of like magic. It's a magic trick sort of. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> So I, I think that we're kind of wrapping up there, Bruce. I just want to say what a what a nice morning this has been to chat with you and and learn about birds and and uh, and get excited about your passion for birding. So thank you so much. I uh, 
I'm sad. Bruce used to be my neighbor in Carp, and now he's moved far away. But uh, maybe <laughs> when COVID is over sometime, we can get together again and, uh, and get some binoculars and, and trek across and, and see some birds. Oh, we will, Graham. We will. Okay. Anyways. So thanks so much. And uh, thank you, all of you students and teachers, for joining in today. And please go out and, and try to uh, try to see some birds, take some photos, post them to Twitter, uh, like Miss Lewis Pryor said. And uh, yeah, we wish you a great day. All the best. Enjoy the warmer weather that's coming and uh, take care. Thanks again, Bruce. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.